Good afternoon, but we've been here 14 years. And I think the interesting thing is that we metamorphosized from where we started. We've been in every building on this <laughs> campus, in the building that's condemned, in the building, in the Ed building, in this building up on the top floor, and of course now where we've been for how many years, Nigel? I don't know. Wow, the building we're in now? Yeah. Ten? Yeah. At least Five ten months, years. Months. Yeah. We run the National Institute for Educational Options, and a lot of people still probably don't know who we are. Um, we try kind of to uh, provide information all the time. When we had our Voluntary School Choice Grant, we did a breakfast every year, and we made everybody go to our PowerPoint presentation before they got food <laughs> so that they would know what we do because we are kind of out of the loop a lot by ourselves. Um, I don't know if you all know, but when Dr. Singleton came here, he had a lot of initiatives that were in the building, uh, which is now condemned. Um, there were different initiatives that he was trying. And he put us all there and said, okay, let's see if you can fly. And um, many of the initiatives came and went, and we're still here. So we're kind of happy about that 15, 14 years later. Um, as, as Dolores said, we work with school choice and parental options. And I think the interesting thing is we have never wavered from our mission and vision. If you go to our website, we are exactly today in the same mission and vision that we were when we started this. And when we started this, there was very little school choice. Um, we were kind of clairvoyant that we knew that school choice was going to be important. All there was back then were magnet schools. And we knew that school choice would be very important. So when you get a chance, I'm going to, we have a lot of things on the table to pass around. This is the school choice options book for the state of Florida. Florida leads the nation in school choice. 1.2 million students choose their school in the state of Florida. 1.2 million, which is absolutely amazing, um, out of the 2.8 million students. 1.2 million. So we have evolved into almost half of the students in the state of Florida, K-12, are in a choice program. And we think that's kind of mind-boggling. Um, it includes open enrollment, it includes choice magnets, it includes public choice, charter schools, career academies, pre-K students who choose to go into a pre-K program, homeschooling, tax credit scholarships, uh, K scholarships for special needs students, and international baccalaureate, which is a choice. Um, lab schools, as you know, there are six lab schools in the state of Florida at state universities, and finally, very important distance education and virtual education. So it is a huge phenomenon today. And when we started our center, all there was were some magnet schools. And so our mission hasn't changed because it's just gotten larger and the number of ability um, to serve students has gotten bigger. So Nigel, why don't you kind of go forward and how we're trying, we've got a little PowerPoint, yes. Can I just ask a quick question because, you know, I think one of the reasons that your initiative lasted is because of the ability to secure external funding. And I think that's really one of the focal points for what people want to hear about. What percentage of your activity is supported by external funding? Well, grants? over the years, we have always been externally funded, okay? First of all, we had, when we came in 98, we uh, went after the magnet school office. I became executive director of Magnet Schools of America. The money for that organization went through us. So the office management and the programmatic areas went through our NIO. So for four years, Nigel was the business manager for Magnet Schools of America, and that was externally funded. Okay. Then when they moved to Washington, D.C., because they were big enough, 
and rich enough to have an office on K Street, which is where their office is, believe it or not, we went after a second grant, and that was the National Career Academy Coalition, again, for school choice. They were just coming aboard, they were just starting an organization, and it started in Philadelphia. It had been very small. They were looking for a home. They knew Magnet Schools of America was leaving, and they knew that they were moved, they moved to Washington, and they know, knew we had helped them become successful. So they said, oh, will you do this for us? And they flew down here from Philly, right, Nigel? And they came and met with us and said, we have X amount of money, we would like you to take over managing our group. In this case, I was not executive director, I was operations manager, and Nigel was business manager for the organization. For four more years, we grew that organization, helping them grow and prosper. And then they flew away to their national office. So in a way, we incubated people, and that's where we brought in our external funding. As that second incubation was happening, the state of Florida, the state of Florida was starting the voluntary public school choice grant application. And we knew that public school choice was really our forte. So we worked to write the first grant for the state of Florida. It did not go through NOVA, but the director of the state happened to have come from Tennessee. He was a political appointment. This is very interesting. He had run Bush's campaign in Tennessee, and he had beaten Al Gore. <laughs> Amazing. Tennessee. In Tennessee. So he was, a, he was very well known. And he was asked by the state of Florida to come and chair the, be the commissioner for school choice in Florida. And people looked at him when he came. He came because his kids went to Florida State. And they said, oh, he's a political appointment. Be careful what you say. I went up there to meet with him about some things. And I, I was very impressed with his abilities and his policy knowledge in the field of school choice. And he's a policy wonk. And I said to him, gee, you know, JV, uh, JC, You've got a great background. Well, about six months later, he called me and he said, you know, we're, we're getting this new grant. Would you like to be the partner? You know them. And usually it was Florida State that was always the partner because they're next door to the DOE. But this case, because of my relationship with him, again, relationships, he gave us the first grant. 500000 was small the first year. And then it got bigger. And we had that grant for five years. The next go round, you're asking about external funding. Um, he he was no longer the chancellor. There was a new chancellor who happens to come from Miami. His name was Carlo Rodriguez, and he said, "Would you be our partner in writing the grant?" And it was supposed to go through Nova. At the last minute, he called me up and he said, "Judy, you know, I'm the new chancellor for choice." and I want the grant to go through the DOE. And everybody looked at me in my office and said, are you crazy? You, we have killed ourselves writing this huge grant. This is the size. And you're gonna hand this to the state of Florida? And I said, well, you know, he's a dear friend, number one. Number two, if we put it through the state, it will impact more of the state parental involvement center. We can't do it as well by ourselves. So everyone flew up to Tallahassee, my whole staff, there were about five of us, and met with their department and handed the grant over to them. Even the grant director, we had paid, they took over paying her, and she finished the grant and submitted it. And it was funded. Wow. Only two state grants were funded out of the 26 million in grants the state of Connecticut, and the state of Florida. I remember Just one One last uh, note. We did prepare on the slide, our last slide, some resources that you can certainly uh, take advantage of. Uh, there are uh, sites that focus on proposal writing, 
there are sample proposals online. Um, there are membership organizations, as Dr. Stein mentioned, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Grant Writers uh, Association, and that association provides training, uh, conferences, contacts, um, um, access to grant writers, um, things that are coming down the pike as they're being announced. They provide that resource uh, for you. And of course, here at the university, there's Pivot where you can certainly look at, uh, you know, look at all sorts of funding sources. And uh, for nonprofits, there are also sites where you can find foundations that fund small grants. And in some cases, when we're working with school districts or partnering with school districts, there are projects that they would like to accomplish and they need funding uh, in order for that to happen. So we partner with that school district, find a nonprofit that matches what they want to do, and then we help them to develop professional development or to design the program or to write the curriculum. And that small pot of money assists, uh, you know, as opposed to writing the Magnet School Assistance Program grant, which is a three-year, $12 million grant, which we just assisted uh, Broward County wow. Schools to do. So we will be a part of that grant in terms of professional development and uh, also parent workshops and those kinds of things. But we assisted the school district to write that grant and then NOVA is partnering with, partnering with them to implement the grant. I'll share some of these with you. Then they might purchase a computer lab for you in order for that computer lab to further their vision. Uh, a couple of things. This has kind of been a nostalgia trip for me. Most of you who know uh, have had the opportunity to, to uh, listen to things. I like digging in my closets to take a look at my proposal. The first one I wrote was in May 1988. It was to the. Uh, it was for audio visual systems for the Surface Warfare Officer School. I was involved with our professional association, and I I made it very clear that I wanted to. Uh, become involved when proposals were written. In other, in other words, the first bullet there, the first number, learn by doing. I volunteered, my colleague volunteered, we became the gophers for other funded proposals. We became the ones that actually worked on things, made things happen. So we got that experience and we established this cadre and the executive director said, you know, the Navy needs somebody to do some work. We're going to uh, give the RFP to several individuals, and this is one of the first ones that I did. It's called uh, Audio Visual Systems, May 1988. The, uh, it funded money. It was funded. All these are funded. I got I got some non-funded ones here How too. How much was that one? Oh, that one was. Oh, that's a good story. <laughs> the RFP said seventy-five thousand. Us and our infinite naivete only asked for fifty thousand. Yeah. Well, that, that's a mistake. They got 75,000. They want to get rid of 75,000. They don't want to have to come up with another RFP for the other 25,000. So when I went there, they said, well, we, you know, we kind of got to pick you because yours was 25,000 cheaper than everybody else's. So we want you to add something to that. And it worked for us, but then we had to do an, if we not had to, we got to do an additional RFP, respond to an additional RFP. As a matter of fact, it was a sole source RFP for the other $25,000. But that was funded and it was, uh, and I'll talk about these, these here too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share these with you and then we'll talk about the specifics in my 15 minutes. The next one was a pretty big one. It was the Iowa Star School Grants. This was four million, it was funded. Uh, it involved organizations around the state of Iowa and it was to do distance education. If you remember uh, Ted Kennedy's initiatives related to opposition of Star Wars, he convinced the Congress to fund something called Star Schools, which to use satellites instead of for wars, to use satellites for education. And with the help of the congressional delegation from Iowa, Republicans and Democrats, congressmen and senators, there was a provision built into this act that said a state with 99 counties can, if successful, be given some kind of extra, uh, uh, not extra credit, but uh, for funding in the Star Schools project. This was after about four or five meetings in Washington. We, we went there, we got permission from the governor to be the uh, grant writer, in other words, to respond to the RFP. And we got this, this $4 million baby, I've got a couple copies of it. And the last bullet up there says, 
go back for more. Acres doesn't. The best place to get additional funds are satisfied funders. Go back, go back, go back. You do it, they either run out of money or they, they get tired of you. Because if you demonstrate success, they're going to know that, well, I don't have any risk here. I know that that technology research and evaluation group from Iowa State University is going to do a good job and give me extra 10% and make me look good as a grant coordinator for my foundation or for my federal organization. So we went back again. Uh, we got another four million in 19, this one says 1994. And th th these are these are big books, right? And yours are big books too. Yep. Everything's in there. The 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 proposal is the blueprint. It's what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it, and how much money you need to do everything in that list. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. We'll come back to some of these other bullets here. And then the one that, that I, I really enjoyed the most was, uh, this was from the federal government and from the uh, United States Navy. I, I pulled four or five of the eight or 10 that I've been involved with. Was from a private foundation, the US West Foundation. They had $500 million and one of their goals was to fund education in the region where U.S. West was at, which was in Iowa, but also in the Great Northwest. So they sent out an RFP, and the RFP was for a unique and uh, creative initiatives in schools using technology and bringing together diverse groups or something like that. So our research group sat down and said, you know, What's unique? Well, everybody talked about things that were interesting and important. And that group came up with the idea for what we call the Da Vinci Project. And that's a picture of Leonardo Da Vinci, by the way. The uh, grantor didn't realize what this was. I don't know whether she never passed any Rorschach tests or whatever. And she didn't say, oh, that's a picture of a person. That's Leonardo Da Vinci. Anyway, the Da Vinci Project brought together art and chemistry. K-12 teachers using instructional technology and distance education to design a new curriculum to motivate students. Everybody thinks about art and, and physics because there's a lot of similarity. Not very many people think about art and chemistry. So that was funded. Um, and a couple of my points made up here I'll come back to related to this project. How much was that one funded? That one, was, and this was, this was kind of fun too. That, this was 350000 and when we got funded, they actually came to Iowa State University where I was working. And the head of the foundation walked in and gave me a check for wow. $200,000. Mm -hmm. Did you quit? There's half. A little <laughs> more. <laughs> 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 you did start. I looked at it and said, Mike Simonson. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, See you later. Well, at least one more question. So you wrote yourself into these grants. Well, we'll doing. talk about that in just okay. a second. Okay. Yeah, okay. well, of course, you write. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. But, but, but it's not like it sounds in terms of yourself. Okay. And then we got the other 150000 at the halfway point when we demonstrated the projects. And then building upon the Iowa project, the state of South Dakota said, well, you know, gosh, Iowa got $4 million. We're a much smaller state. Maybe we can get $3 million. So we created the Digital Dakota Network project, which also went back to Star Schools, going back, to, going back for more. To be uh, to be funded, and this was funded for three million. I'll go through these points very quickly. This is one that we put together: the digital community network empowering the workforce for WLRN. And this was kind of a groovy project, except it wasn't funded. Uh, but I, I, I said I pull out some that weren't funded, uh, and the reason this wasn't funded is a mystery to me because I thought this was one of the better ones. But it built upon what we had done before. And uh, by the way, the Digital Dakota Network and this particular project uh, were done here at Nova Southeastern University when you were still here. Back to the points, learn by doing. When you said done here, you mean written and here? No, yeah, written. those two were written here at Nova Southeastern. Uh, learn by doing, create a team. Uh, of, of course you write yourself in, but you create a team and that team works together before you even seek funding. In other words, identify five or six like-minded people and regularly, once a month, once every couple of months, sit down and talk about nothing but what is it we're interested in? What, what kinds of projects can we work on collaboratively, and not just grant writing? And 
where can we go to seek funds or let people know that we are capable of <coughs> responding to proposals and successful at it? In other words, it isn't, it isn't Mike Simonson or Al Mizell, it's the Technology Research and Evaluation Group with Mike Simonson as the coordinator, but Charlie Schlosser and Nancy Mauschak and four or five other people who are part of that team. So it's not you going after it, it's that research group. And you establish that ad hoc, you pull it together. And uh, avoid some RFPs. Don't go after RFPs you're not interested in. There's two things that I was told early on that are, are your biggest nightmares when it comes to grant running. You won't get funded and you will. And so the last thing you want is to have somebody give you $500,000 and say, now work on this project. And have you go, oh God, I hate it. This is the dumbest project. It's no fun. I have to travel all over. I've got to work with those people I don't like. Uh, because then that, you know, it's, it's work. If they don't give you the money and then say goodbye, have fun with it. They, they want you to give them about 10% more than what they're paying for. And that means you've got to deliver that 10% more or you're never going to get funded again. One PI. I've never understood how some of these organizations can have a Politburo of directors who, who, who can trump the PI, the, the principal investigator. First of all, the granting agencies want to have one person that they can hold accountable. It's obviously the organization, but they want one person they go because they don't want a group of people so they can point fingers at one another. But there's one person in charge. Now that can rotate. You can have co-PIs. You can have subdivisions of your proposal where people get of that four million dollars, it's 750,000 to work just with teacher education institutions. And that person becomes the PI of a subcontract from the main contract. But once again, you've got a very clearly delineated chain of command and responsibility, authority also. Uh, meet the grantor, some of you said this, yeah, they, they want to get to know who you are. If you, think you, if you think you've got an inside track, fly to Washington, meet the guy at NSF. Uh, go to Oak Ridge Universities in uh, Tennessee and meet the lady who's in charge of, uh, of that, that project. Fly out to Denver and meet the uh, uh, person who's in charge of the U.S. West Foundation. By the way, when Quest took over U.S. West, they took the $500 million that was in the foundation and they rolled it back into their, uh, uh, to, to the, uh, to the people who own the company, uh, to the to the uh, uh, stockholders, excuse me, and the stockholders, and they had an immediate return on that stockholder investment. But the foundation went away, and they didn't fund it anymore. So that was an interesting side of it. Your RFP is a template. They're going to tell you exactly in the RFP, the request for proposal, what they want, and they'll even put in many cases percentages down. Twenty percent must be for evaluation. Well, that tells you that twenty percent must is what should fund evaluation. Twenty percent of the million dollars. 200,000 ought to go to the, or slightly less, ought to go to the evaluation component. So it's a, it's a guide for you. Give them what they want, fund it to the template, give 10% more, and always, always give a little more than what they think they're gonna get, that will make them happy. Always produce professional artifacts, uh, and create an identity. Yeah. You can talk about the Da Vinci Project like it was a real thing not just an abstract idea and, and, and um, keep yourself from saying the three hundred thousand dollar uh, u.s west foundation grant because that's that's what you naturally do you start talking about the da vinci project or the iowa distance education alliance or the whatever the project is uh, always put in a timeline <laughs> i pulled this out of my box because it's kind of fun Remember these oh, things? Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. Overhead transparency. Yeah, isn't that fun? Remember uh, those? That was our timeline. First thing they wanted to know is when are you going to do all this stuff? Yeah. This was part of the proposal. They want to know when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and how much it's going to cost. So there's a detailed budget in any successful proposal. And then celebrate. Don't party. But if you're going to go through all this work and you got this team and, and, you, and, and you're requesting funding, and you've gotten the funding, have periodic celebrations of reaching benchmarks. That keeps everybody happy. And plus, take pictures of it and send that back, not with a, with a lampshade on your head and a cocktail glass in your hand, yeah. but showing how you brought in the local newspaper to take uh, pictures of the grant team and how they're working with the third grade kids in an art project. 
that's a celebration. You have cookies and you have iced tea or whatever. But that also is a way to get the acclaim that the grantor wants. And the granting agencies, the people you've been successful with, are the best sources of additional funding. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Question. Questions? Kind of have a broad based kind of question. So, if you've been in this business for 20 or 30 years, I'm not, I'm not aging anybody in the room, right? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. What do you think is different in the culture, if you will, of grant writing and, and being the recipient, you know, from both ends, than the culture might have been 30 years ago? Well, there was, there was more money. There, I mean, you could. Right. I mean, back in the 60s, they threw money at you. You had foundation grants, you had scholars. My husband was a National Science Foundation scholar. He, they threw scholarships at him. The point is, you had a lot more money. I think. And I was just thinking and the I, and the competition I think was probably less. Today, today, the money is more in the private foundation than it is at the federal government and at the, even at the state. And I see that as a huge shift, That's a as a huge sea change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think people know that. Like, I'll go to a meeting and I'll say, who's the American Federation of Children? And everybody in the room will sit there and look at me like, what? And I'll say, do you know the money that they have available to give? To be? And they don't even know it exists. In other words, there is this whole sea change that people, I don't think people in schools of education wow. understand. I think Never so. talk about money. Uh, the, the, the big mistake that President Hanbury makes, he talks about, what does he say, $300 million? Yeah. 350. Yeah. We should say we want five centers of excellence. Mm -hmm. All right. of which are externally funded and that make a reputation. And if they each bring in $20 million, well, that's great. But you don't talk about $30 million. But he's got he's making data, you know, dash for it's, it's a sign of naivety on That's an interesting the he's reason had, that granting had, agencies had, want to give point. money is because they want to make change. They want mm -hmm. things to happen. And in in almost every instance, in addition to wanting something that needs to get done. They've got money that they have to spend. The federal government has to spend that money every fiscal year. If they don't, they get in a lot of trouble. Why you know we gave you appropriate this money? You didn't, you didn't grant it, so they want to spend. The foundations are the same way. Now, I agree that there are the the, 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 the way foundations and other organizations give funding is changing, but that kind of comes with the territory. What what we need to do is to pull together that group of, of dedicated individuals and work long term on, on approaches that will, will further the areas of excellence that we think are important. Just as you guys have done. You've got an area of excellence. You've worked on it for 15 years. And it sort of it's become self-funding because it's so good and you understand. And that's that's the approach that that uh, I think we, we do did with the other areas. research and evaluation group, and that's what we should be I doing here in the Fisher School, yeah, you pulling know. together a group of people, not on a short-term basis, but on a long-term basis, to work on uh, areas of excellence exactly. that then ultimately might also For example, special funds. ed is a very important area in, in our school of education. Mm -hmm. We have an excellent reputation. Look at Mickey smiling. <laughs> Your, our reputation is well known in the area of ESE. I'm just saying, all over the state, all over the nation. So that is an area of excellence that maybe a team could work together. And I know you do. Um, and I think that's the important distance ed. You've got, we took Mike's journal to the FDLA conference. We showed to everybody, Al and I, you know, this is a big area of expertise with Al, one of the founders of AECT. Is it AECT? AECT. AECT, one of the pioneers. There's a video about Al. You are, you know, we have great expertise in the area of distance education. We have great expertise in the area of school choice. So I think that I agree with you, Mike, that these are areas we need to build on. 
and not try to be everything to everybody because we can't. Do Special it. education at this. Well, that sounds. You know, I don't know about that. Sounds, that sounds well. I don't know which way you're going to go. There are two types of categories, I guess you would say. There are service grants and there are research grants. And so you have to understand where your project really fits. Right. Is it a service, as you've mentioned, or is it a research? Or is there a problem you're trying to uh, solve? Is there a theory you're trying to, uh, you know, um, propose? What, what, what is it you really, what story are you telling? Mm -hmm. Something in terms of service, something in terms of uh, research. Mm -hmm. Four quick points. Um, Mickey brought to our attention the Cy Sims brand, and so Dan McCurian, Steve Eck, and I got together as a team under their tutelage and with their help, and we finally ended up submitting a $43,000 proposal. We don't know if we'll get it, but, but we did get to work together and with their support to going back and forth, and Dan put in a huge amount of work on that. Also, another resource we have available is over in the library, the uh, Office of Grants, Roxanne uh, Ross, and mm -hmm. she's really wonderful to work with and will help search for things. And then in line with what you all were saying earlier about knowing the person, I always thought it was interesting when Senior Comp first got started, it was because Cecil Sugarman, a volunteer, was playing golf at uh, Emerald Hills Golf Club. And when he sat down for lunch, the guy across from him, they got talking and he started telling him that he and Cecil and I have been talking about trying to find some way to take our senior net program that was here where we charge seniors to help the low income people be able to take the, the uh, training and we needed a grant. And this guy says, well, you ought to go to a foundation and ask for the money. And Cecil said, I don't know how to do that. I wouldn't know where to go. And the guy says, well, come to me. I have the Mandel Foundation in Cleveland. And from then on, he gave us $10,000 10 different times mm -hmm. to keep doing it. And as you were saying, go back to the same ones you know. So it worked mm -hmm. 10 times. Didn't you have Bell South also? Isn't there a picture somewhere of you that's getting with a senior, big check? That's with Senior Net. Oh, yeah, Net. Mm -hmm. right. trying to do. The other thing is journals. Mike has the distance journal, which gives us a lot of visibility nationally. We have the school choice journal that we started here which is a national, international journal that I'm the contributing editor to. That's a huge thing. Getting more people involved in research, I think that's very important, not just grants. I mean, this year for the first time, I'm so proud that Kathy Thomas and Candace Lacey presented at our conference um, a research study, qualitative research study on charter school uh, owner, people who start their own charter school and they reviewed, they went all around the state and interviewed those people and did a qualitative study. So, you know, I want more people interested in this. I think this is wonderful that we had those professors that the first time that our, our university presented with Stanford and Harvard and everybody else. So, so that's something we got to encourage. There is an institutional right? climate that we need to work on too, and that yes. is, my boss told me back, he said, well, I told him I was gonna start writing some proposals, and I said, but, you know, they probably won't get funded, and he told me, if you write it, it counts just as much, in my opinion, and in your promotion and tenure as a, as a exact. journal doc, a journal, a journal acceptance. Mm -hmm. so in terms of you put it in your resume, it doesn't matter if it's funded or not. It still re represents right. your scholarly contribution to exactly. your field. Now, if you get funded, what's the payoff? Well, the payoff is obviously the boss thinks this is pretty cool, mm -hmm. and you get that five hundred thousand dollars or seven hundred fifty thousand dollars you get to hire two or three graduate students and part of the funds don't tell the graduating agency this part of the funds part of the resources that that you've gotten if you get funded when you get funded is to help you secure the next round of funding mm -hmm. always be thinking about the next three hundred so, so four hundred thousand small first but should you go small initially <laughs> It depends on your project. You know, from the granting agency's perspective, many times ten thousand dollars is as hard to get as, as yeah, five hundred thousand. Right. Um, but but yeah, sometimes the ten thousand dollar ones are easier to get your mind around because you don't feel like your whole life is going to it. Things that, that we don't do very well here are things like salary savings and things like what the, the what, what's the department get out of it? What is the what does the person who's the PI get out of it? And we don't. If you write a proposal, you don't necessarily want anything out of it. But you don't want 
to be derided for the fact you got a grant. You don't, you know, you'd like to think the people you work with in Florida would look at that as a positive thing. And we're growing into that in the Fisher School and all that. We're working on it. We're working still on it. Still naive. <coughs> but, but meetings like this make that much more likely. I think something that's worth noting is that the university, in trying to change the culture um, in terms of research, the university has implemented a research incentive policy where a percentage of the um, recovered facilities and administrative costs are distributed to the university, to the school, meaning to the dean, and also to the principal investigator. So you can then use a percentage of the fund that is recovered on a monthly basis to purchase equipment that was funded by, by the grantee, by the funding agency. You can use it to pay for grad assistance, and that's great stuff because mm -hmm. back when we did the uh, Star funding? Schools project for South Dakota, so well, we didn't have that policy. Yeah. Yeah. There was five hundred thousand dollars in salary that that was paid for by the South Dakota project that I was that Charlie Slosser and I uh, generated. And that Mary Ellen gave that money back to the general fund, mm -hmm. and and uh, that was because she had to, not because she wanted to. Oh, and we talked to him about that. Well, you know, that doesn't make sense. Should the department get some return on on their investment in us? Well, that, that's not the way. But and so that's an example of how NOVA is becoming more mature in its approach to the grant writing process. And I think maturity uh, is evident in a lot of ways. Maybe the president's talking, I'm, I'm being a little facetious there, talking about how much money he wants to bring in, but it's pretty clear that that's on the priority list for if you want to be a successful professor here. In the you better get involved in some grant writing. Well, and just, you know, to re, uh, re, reiterate again, um, that was redundant. Um, we do have on FIN, there is a button for grants and research, and that is a place where we can expand what we include under that, but Alina does a great job to update that so that any open competitions that seem appropriate are listed there. Um, and, and that's done on a regular basis, so monthly. And also, there are um, funded projects across the university that are listed there so that you can get an opportunity to look at what is um, being funded and where other centers are, or other schools are, in terms of funded projects. Um, and again, we are here to be a support for that. Fischler is lucky. Most of the schools don't have, um, the deans haven't given to this endeavor and um, that's what we want to be able to do is grow those things so well, go ahead Mike I was gonna say it just occurred to me every foundation that I've ever worked with closely the director of that foundation has a discretionary fund and they can almost at the snap of a finger give you five or ten thousand dollars that's right on their own signature without having to go through an elaborate R and wow. process. That's true. And so that's another reason why it's important to get to know those folks and, and to, to to follow those leads when you're talking to somebody at the golf course who says, Well, I happen to know some people in the whatever and follow up on that and, and oftentimes not oftentimes, sometimes that that person will say, you know, that sounds like an interesting idea. You probably need a little a uh, little seed money to get started on, on that idea. And what they're really doing is telling you that they want to buy into your idea so you don't give it to somebody else. So mm -hmm. it works both ways. I mean, they're not going to be giving you the money because they like you and they think you, you, you've got a great golf game. They're giving you the money because they think you're going to deliver something that's going to make them look good as the head of the foundation. Wow. And I just want to plant a little seed, and I've talked to some of you about this already. Um, something that, I, that I, I haven't really made any active efforts right now, but um, what we'd like to get started is a Fischler Research Journal online that, is, that features faculty student research. So, you know, if anybody is interested in that, I know you probably have, if anybody's interested in that or has some ideas about how to get that started, just zip me an email and I want to pull together, like you said, an ad hoc committee to first look at how can we organize that. One emphasis there is undergraduate, getting our undergrads involved in research with faculty. So, just wanted to plant that seed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. Thank everybody for coming. Um, and, um, <laughs>
Thank you, Mike.